So now we're ready to talk about the circuitry in the brain stem that mediates the vestibulo-ocular reflex. Now, before we get into the details here, I want you to understand the purpose and importance of this reflex. Imagine that you need to fixate on some near object, and I would encourage you to do so. I'm going to fixate on the tip of this pen, and now turn your head from side to side while you fixate on that pen. So hopefully you can see what's happening in my own orbits as I turn my head from side to side. When I move my head to the right, my eyes shift toward the left. When I move my head to the left, my eyes shift towards the right. It's, it's truly one of the remarkable sensory motor reflexes we have in our bodies. The movements of our eyes are exactly matched to the movements of our heads, both in amplitude and in velocity. If that were not so, we would not be able to maintain fixation during the movements of our head. So how is this possible? Well, this figure 14.10 illustrates the circuitry that make this possible. If we were to turn our head, let's say, towards the left, we would need to turn our eyes back towards the right. So if I to rotate my head to the left, hopefully you can see that my eyes are turning to the right. So turning my head to the left would be consistent with activating my left semicircular canal. And so what we would want to see happen is a turning of the eyes towards the right. So what is it going to take to turn my eyes to the right? It's going to require the activation of my right lateral rectus and my left medial rectus. These muscles will contract and they'll tug my eyes over to the right. Well, in order to allow my eyes to smoothly rotate to the right, it would be very helpful if we reduced the muscle tone in the antagonistic muscles. So that means as I'm contracting my right lateral rectus, it makes sense to reduce the tone of the right medial rectus so the eye can smoothly shift to the right. Likewise, for my left eye, while my right medial rectus is contracting, it makes great sense to want to relax the left lateral rectus muscle. And this will allow the globe to smoothly turn towards the right. So this should give you some sense of how this happens. If the signal is leftward turning, activating my left semicircular canals, that's the input signal. The output is turning my eyes to the right. I'm going to need to have some signal that crosses the midline and activates my right abducens nerve. I need a signal that will activate my left ocular motor nerve. And then I need to have some kind of signal that will suppress the antagonistic muscles. So let's see how this works. Again, with activation of, let's say, um, ganglion neurons on the left side that innervate the horizontal canal there, we would engage a series of neurons that sit in this vestibular nuclear complex. One of these neurons is going to release an excitatory neurotransmitter in the abducens nucleus of the opposite side of the brainstem. That abducens nucleus then is going to innervate the lateral rectus muscle and cause it to contract, tugging that opposite eye, in this case the right eye, towards the lateral side of the visual field. Okay, so this is going to achieve that rightward eye movement. Now what about what's going on with the left eye? Well, we need to activate the medial rectus muscle of the left eye. And in order to do that, we need to have a second kind of neuron that grows from the abducens nucleus to the ocular motor nucleus. This is called an internuclear interneuron, or an internuclear neuron. So it's going to release an excitatory transmitter and drive the activation of the ocular motor alpha motor neuron that will cause contraction of this medial rectus muscle and the turning of the left eye towards the right. Okay, now, now what is it going to take to relax the antagonistic muscles? The way that this happens is via an inhibitory interneuron. And that inhibitory neuron grows out of the 
vestibular nuclear complex and suppresses the firing of the alpha motor neuron of the abducens nucleus on the same side of the brainstem and it suppresses that internuclear neuron that connects the abducens nucleus with the ocular motor nucleus. So essentially we activate one pair of cells and deactivate the corresponding pair on the other side of the brainstem through synaptic inhibition. And this allows us to achieve the functional goal of turning our eyes directly opposite the rotation of the head. Now, there's a phenomenon that you need to know about. Um, it can be uh, an important clinical sign, and it's called vestibular nystagmus. Now, nystagmus is uh, one of those interesting words that it's worth knowing its meaning. It means a nodding of the head. So, nystagmus is something that we see in the eyes, but the action is very much like nodding of the head as if you're falling asleep. So, what do we tend to do sometimes when we're listening to a boring Coursera lecture is that we might doze off, our head goes through a slow phase, and then we might snap back up as we sort of wake ourselves up by the action of nodding our head forward. So the idea is that there's a slow phase, and then there's a rapid phase. Slow phase, and then a rapid phase. That's nystagmus. So it's a rhythmical form of reflexive eye movement that includes the slow component in one direction that is interrupted by a very fast saccade-like component in the opposite direction. So if my hands represent movements of the eyes, you can imagine the eyes moving slowly to one side and then quickly snapping back and moving slowly and snapping back. Now, <clears throat> vestibular nystagmus is normally driven by persistent head rotation. So if you were to spin someone around in a chair, you might want to try this with a willing volunteer, and then suddenly stop that person, what you might see is that their eyes are going to be in nystagmus. That's because for a few seconds now, the endolymph is going to be deflecting the cupulas of the horizontal canals. And you should see a very predictable type of nystagmus with the eyes going in the direction opposite the movement of the head and then they'll snap back and continue to move opposite the direction of rotation until that endolymph stabilizes relative to the fixed structures of the horizontal canal. Now it's important to recognize that it's the slow component of nystagmus that's driven by the vestibulo-ocular reflex. The fast saccadic component, that reset, that is a different kind of reflex that repositions the eyes in the orbits. That's not a function of the VOR, the vestibulo-ocular reflex. That has to do with more of a sensory motor uh, integration reflecting proprioceptors from eye muscles driving a quick reflexive reset of eye position in the orbit. So what's important is to realize that the vestibular nuclear complex drives the slow component of vestibular nystagmus. Now we can learn a lot from watching the movements of the eyes, especially if nystagmus is present. Uh, the type of nystagmus we see, that is the direction of the slow component of the eye movement, is an indication of the balance of activity that we find arriving from the two eighth cranial nerves. And that balance is critical because if the balance is offset, either because we are actually rotating our head or because there's hypofunction on one side of the vestibular system, then there will be a drive of the eyes consistent with the vestibulo-ocular reflex. Okay, so if we turn our head to the right, we're elevating activity in the right side, decreasing it on the left. That's going to drive our eyes to the opposite side. But also, if we were to have hypofunction on the left, such that there is now an imbalance, the eyes would be driven in the slow phase of dystagmus towards the left as if we were actually turning our head to the right, but we're not. So if this were the situation with 
hypo function on the left side, we would expect the slow phase of nystagmus to go to the opposite side of the head, away from the elevated side, so to the left, towards the side of the hypo function, and then the quick phase would reset. So hypo function to the left means that the slow phase is towards the left, and then the quick flick back to the right. So when you're evaluating clinical patients for the presence of nystagmus, it's important to keep in mind that you're looking for evidence of this pathological alteration in the balance of activity between the two sides of the vestibular nuclear complex. And this is what gives rise to the expression of nystagmus under conditions that wouldn't normally induce this kind of ocular motor behavior. So obviously, you want to have your patient's head uh, stable and in neutral position while you're examining this patient and the possibility of nystagmus. Now you may induce certain head movements as a variable which will test the operation of the vestibular system, but I'll leave that discussion for the clinicians who may be teaching you about how to do a thorough vestibular examination. Here in medical neuroscience what's critical is that you appreciate the effect of an imbalance of activity on the two sides of the vestibular system and what that would do for the induction of nystagmus in the movements of the eyes. Now we've been emphasizing movements around the z-axis that would be consistent with shaking the head to the left or to the right and that obviously is focusing on the activities of the horizontal connects. <clears throat> but one can have nystagmus really in any direction. One can have a rotation of the eyes that would be consistent with stabilizing gaze against movements of the head in the nodding direction, okay? So that would imply that if there were dysfunction uh, associated with a superior canal or an inferior canal, there may be nystagmus where the eyes would perhaps drift up and flick down or maybe drift down and flick up, or there may be some rotational component to the nystagmus that would reflect the integrated activity of some combination of canals on one side of the head versus the other. But the key principle is that the imbalance in the signals arriving from the two vestibular nerves are what will drive the vestibulo-ocular reflex.